Hi guys, welcome along part three now of this engine build and today we're actually going to finally start building it properly rather than all the dry building and measuring and stuff. A uh, couple of shout outs. <clears throat> First one is to, um, it's from the Defender 2.net forums. I don't know if it's Col or CO1 or Co1. I think it's Col, Colin. But um, he was replying to a request I put on there about asking about the torque settings for the um, piston spray jet things. Um, a piston cooling jets, I think they're called. Uh, and if you remember at the end of my video yesterday, I put out, uh, I, I showed you on my phone that I had all the standard torques for standard bolts of certain grades, and the standard torque for that little bolt was 11.7 newtons. So that's what we're going to do. And that was his suggestion, which he actually posted afterwards. So he, he asked me if I could give him a shout out, even though I'd already thought of it. So there you are, Col C01, I think it's Col. Um, so there you go. Uh, keep your suggestions coming. No doubt you'll um, you'll get one at least one or two in before I think of them. Um, thing is, my videos are always sort of ahead. So you know, I'm, I'm filming this now, and what is it? It's it's three o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday. So it's probably a good six or eight hours before you're going to see it. So when you suggest stuff, I've already done it. So. Um, the other one was for Simon. Um, Simon asked a question on the. Uh, on the YouTube channel in the comments below, which is always the best way to ask questions because if you send me a PM over on Defender.net, it's like you ask the question, you get the answer. If you do it on here or on a live forum, you ask the question, everyone gets to see the answer, so it's helpful to everyone. And also that way I end up not answering the same question loads of times. But um, basically, I won't give any names, but somebody asked me about the quantity of paint I'd recommend for painting their chassis. and. Um, Basically, with my 90 chassis, I gave it sort of four sprayed-on coats, um, and I used all of the two and a half litres I had. So I would say, if you're brush painting your chassis and it's a 110, I would recommend getting five litres because two and a half certainly ain't going to be enough. Um, so you'll probably use four. The other thing I would suggest is when you finish, put the lid back on the tin and perhaps seal it up with some cling film or in a plastic bag or something. Because what I found with my Carlos tins, I come to open them up you know, a few weeks after I'd last used them and they've got a hell of a skin on them and I ended up throwing a load of Carlos S away. I threw a litre away because it just turned to like a jelly-like substance. It was horrible and it wouldn't break down. I couldn't thin it or anything. So I don't know what, it's, it's probably the glass flakes in it all sort of congealing or whatever. But um, yeah, um, and the other thing was, I, if you remember, I talked about Arkwright and some advice I had from them and the advice was kind of not incorrect, but it sort of misled me that, and I, and I was led to believe that I couldn't use the Coralus S and then paint the QDR over the top, um, and I was also led to believe that you couldn't paint RF16 over the QDR. You can, you can do all of that. So, um, if you want to do your chassis with QDR as the primer and then put the RF16 gloss black on the top or whatever, use the QDR for a primer or anything else, it does seem to be. As resilient to rust as the Carlos S is, although I don't think it's as tough, I don't know. Um, that test piece I did ages ago is still out in the garden now, nearly 18 months later, it's still not rusted. So, um, anyway, I'm waffling. So, um, yeah, as I say, Simon asked the question uh, basically, uh, what is stoning? Is it a means of smoking and making myself feel satisfied? <laughs> no. Um, stoning is basically a term where you use a stone to clean up a surface rather than a file or any cutting tool or sandpaper or whatever you use a nice stone so the easiest way to show you is if we go to the bench and I'll show you what it is I do with the couple of stones I've got there's one I've got I can't find it's a triangular one but it's quite coarse so we wouldn't be using that one anyway but um, I've got the three here that I could find so uh, let's get to the bench and have a look and then we'll start looking at putting this engine together okay so here we are at the bench and this there of shout out. Um, so stoning is all about using a stone. Now all of my stones are pretty knackered and broken but this is basically this was 100 mil long and this is all I've got left. Um, you can see this is like a, a wedge shape stone okay. Um, there's the number for it. I think this is all RS numbers 473600. Come on camera. 100 by 25 mil. Okay so that's just like a I don't know what grade it is, but you can see it's all sort of pretty clogged up and I need to give it a good clean. But um, that's the one I use most commonly because it's got a nice wide face on it. And I've got another little one here, 
which is a triangular in section. Um, it's a bit coarser, but it's got the it's good for getting into corners if you need to get in and sort of remove some damage whatever from internal corner. And again, that's an RS number eight two seven seven one zero hundred by thirteen. So that's a triangular section. And then here we've got a square section. Well, I just this is just in a bag. I don't know numbers. But this is my finest stone, and this is just a square section and you can see it's just literally it's just literally a stone it's like a grinding stone but very very fine so what we do with these is like for instance on these mating faces of these bearing caps um they're actually um shaped by the look of it because they have lines in them this way they're either shaped or they're done this way with a with a milling cutter um so basically what we want to do is just remove any edges and you can see like on this one here, you can see we've got shiny areas. Okay, and that'll be where the cutter has just come onto the surface and then gone off the surface. And what you'll sometimes find is you will end up with a raised area where the cutter sort of pushes itself on and pushes off and stuff. So make sure you do it without the bearings. Do not ever, ever stone the bearings on this edge. Okay, if you do that, you'll, really, you'll, you'll um, relieve the pinch. And what it is, when it all clamps together, these edges actually pinch together with the next bearing. So if that's the bearing underneath it, they clamp together hard, and that's what holds them in place and stops them spinning. If you stone them, you will end up with a spun bearing, I would, I would imagine. So don't ever do anything to those edges. If you need to deburr them, you can just, just clean the edge like that. Okay, if it's got a sharp edge on it. Just clean the edge and maybe deburr the back face, but don't rub that face. Do not stone that face off. Okay, that's a very accurately manufactured component with the right amount of pinch. So on these faces here, okay, well, I mean, they're already done, so I can't really show you too much, but I'll use the fine stone. So what we do is you get your stone and in a kind of circular motion, just rub the face off. Don't be tempted to do this because when you do this, you tend to do that exaggerated you kind of rock over the edges so if you just stay in the middle and do a circular motion and you'll feel if you've got any edges because you'll feel it pick up on it okay so that's that one done and that's it you mustn't go too mad with it because you're not trying to remove material all you're trying to do is take away any little high spots like if when you build the engine if you've knocked this corner you may end up with little high little high nubbing on there which is enough to hold it away when it's clamping so just you know and you could you could stone these faces as well if you want to just give them a gentle stone but you know you're not looking at removing material you could just clean up those corners you're not looking at removing material all you want to do is just make the face perfectly flat and once you've done that these parts need to be cleaned again either blow some brake cleaner down there and then blow them off with the compressed air wash them again in some clean paraffin or whatever but don't put them in the engine without being clean because any deposits that have come off of there will turn your engine oil into grinding paste. So you have been warned. And as I say, anything I do on here, you know, um, I won't take any responsibility if you do it and get it wrong. <laughs> okay, so there you go. So, and you can see down in there, you see if, I don't know if the camera will bloody focus. Horrible day, it's pouring down as you can hear. Totally fed up with this bloody weather. I don't know if you can see, you can't see it, but down in there on the edge, if I get some light on it, down in there on the edge, there's deposits of stone all the way along that edge. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. That's where you need to be removing that and washing it out. Okay, don't just bolt it in the engine. Okay, so um, that's all about stoning. So. These are all marked with the number of the bearing on the front face. I don't know why I'm putting that back in there because I've got to wash it. But um, there we are. So that's what stoning is all about. Um, I would say a good average grade to go for would be this one, this 473600. The other thing is this nice little wedge shape uh, for getting into corners, and you've also got a large flat face on it, so it's really good for. Make sure that bearing's out of the way. It's really good for going over the face like that. You can see. And it just takes away any edges and, and lumps and bumps. It's good practice to get into with any mating faces. Just give them a gentle stone. Don't do it with aluminium because it will clog up. Um, with aluminium you're better off using the very, very fine file and just literally the weight of the file on it. 
Anyway, um, I'm going to get all this cleaned up and then we'll uh, start building this engine. Okay, so here on the bench are the first parts we're going to assemble. And the first one is this filter, which I've mentioned before, and this is going into the oil gallery, which feeds number one. Um, or it's the oil gallery that is feeding from number one. I can't work it out which way it's going. But um, this goes on up to the head then. So this is basically a filter for the cams um, to stop the lifters getting any crap or anything sent into them. Again, no mention of this whatsoever in the manual. Um, manual just finishes with undoing these bolts and removing the crank. And then the first part of the next assembly is replacing these bolts and refitting the crank. So no mention of this, no mention of the piston cooling jets, whatever. So useless. So anyway, this, this is basically a plastic tube. And what I've got here is a, um, this is a, what's this, a five mil long socket, which we're going to push it down in with. So we'll get on over to the block over here, like so. And we can see the, this is the number one main bearing here. So this is basically, it only goes in one way because on here you've got a, a flare. If the camera will focus, come on. You've got a flare on there um, and you can see you wouldn't be able to put it in the other way because it's like a barb. So that's literally just going to slot down in there. It's all been blown out and washed out and everything. So we're just going to push that down in. It's quite tight. And then with the socket, just going to push it in until it stops. And there is actually a, I should have showed you before I pressed it in, that area on the, on the, end, on the top end of it where the square holes are cut out of it, it's slightly larger. It's like 8.8 .8 diameter. And the rest of it is 8.6 so it goes down so it's in there now you can see we go we can see it down in there now with the light on you can see it just sat down in there okay so that's how far down it should go uh, to remove it I think I mentioned this before I just got like a, a coarse um, lightly screwed it into the top and pulled it out uh, do you want to see that yeah go on let's show you that okay so what I've got here is a number what is this? Number four, stud extractor. Okay, I'll make sure it's all clean and everything, he says, when dirt comes off on his finger. But um, basically, we can screw that into the top of there until it turns, and then just with a twisting motion, just pull it out like so. Okay, so I'm going to pull that out now, make sure it's clean, and then put it back in. Right, so once that's done, then we can clean the bearing with our finger. You remember your finger, your skin is a fantastic cleaner. And then we can replace the bearing. I want to put these, these bearings out. I mark them up with a number and I put it on the front edge. So I know that bearing goes in that way. So we can literally just pop that one in, level it up. Remember these bearings have no tangs. They have no tangs to line them up in, in the edges here. So you just have to basically put them in and visually center them up. Make sure they're in the center. I mean that way. Um, and also Another thing I noticed was this oil hole here, this one here, you can see it doesn't line up perfectly. Um, and I thought that was maybe a, a mistake from King, but I've checked the genuine Ford bearings, they're exactly the same. So it may be a mistake in the drilling of the block, or it may be like a restriction to, uh, to reduce the size of the hole. So there we go. Um, so that's that. So we're ready now to do our piston cooling jets. Now, the piston cooling jets go in these holes down here. So the camera's knocking about. I've got it on a tripod. And the tripod hits everything when I pick it up. But they go down in there. You've got the oil feed hole there, and then you've got the threaded hole there that screws in with. And I've seen on the forums a lot of people talking about changing these um, without taking the engine out. And I think that would be extremely difficult. So if I forget, remind me. But what we need to do, look at before we get the sump on, is if it would be possible to do this. Um, with the crank, the con rods, the ladder frame and everything in the way. Um, I don't think it would, but we'll see. So well, we'll go from there. So we'll get these cooling jets in and that'll be the next part of the video. Okay, so these oil scorchers I did mention in the last video, but in case you didn't see it, these are the later type. Um, so you've got the oil feeding through here into here and it's going through and then spraying out. It goes that way up and it's actually spraying oil into the top of the piston and it's cooling the piston and lubricating the small end of the con rod. So that's that one. The earlier type is literally just this tube and then you have a tube coming out. Uh, there is no valve or anything in there. So this has a non-return valve or a, a pressure relief valve. It's basically a ball and a spring so that if you get a situation where you've got low oil pressure, so hot oil, it's idle say, 
um, this will shut and it will save the oil pressure to the rest of the engine rather than losing oil pressure through an open hole. So um, this is a far better idea. So if you've got an earlier engine, there seems to be some controversy about at what point the changeover was made. Um, this engine was made in April to what, March 2011. The vehicle's April 2011. So um, we can see that this one's got the later jet. So we know that April 2011 was later. So unless there was a crossover, um, if you were before April 2011, you may well have the earlier jet. So if you do suffer with oil pressure problems, this could be a fix. And as I just said, we're going to look at if you can do this by just removing the sump and not having to take the engine apart. So um, we'll put those in in a second. Then we've got these tiny little bolts here. They're little M6 bolts with a where are we? With a, uh, a female Torx head. It's an E8 head. You can see it's not hexagonal. So you have to get these sockets like this to do them up. And it's basically like the reverse of a Torx. So, so this is like your Torx, Torx wrench. And the socket is like the Allen key. Where am I? Off the camera. Where am I? Here we are. So that's the that's like your torque rent, your torx bit, and then your your socket is almost like the um, Allen bolt that you've got with the torx head in it. So um, I'll put a dropper two four three on each of those before we put them in. So I'm going to move the camera now so you can see what I'm doing, and then what I'll do is we'll get those in place, and then we'll bolt. We'll do all four of them, and then we'll get all four bolts uh, locked up, and then we'll get them all in. So let's move the camera and see where we go from here. Okay, so I'll get these squirter jets in, make sure they're clean. They've all been washed out and blown through previously, so I'm not really too fussed about giving them another clean now because they've been sealed away in a, in a takeaway container. I keep calling them a Chinese takeaway container. Well, that's not strictly true because it could be an Indian or a Mexican or whatever. We don't have any Mexican takeaways around here. So, there we go, that's those in. Like so, so they're all lined up. We've got the bolt holes lined up as well. So we're going to take, take our bolts. I hope you can see what I'm doing. And just put one drop of thread lock on there. Don't need too much. Just enough to hold it there. And you can wind that in with the fingers. All of the threads have been cleaned, so everything's all nice and free. Not free as in doesn't cost anything, free as in free moving. Bloody rain coming in again, it's so sad. My neighbours have got friends around and having a barbecue underneath a, a bloody gazebo. <laughs> this weather is just pants, total and utter pants. Mind you, this time last year it was really sunny, if you remember, in the UK, and we were all moaning it was too hot. So I remember moaning it was too hot to do any bloody spray, and I had to get some painting done, and I just couldn't. So, there we go. If this is boring you to death, fast forward. I have a contingency of viewers that want to see every single thing I do, so. If you don't want to see it, fast forward. Unfortunately, those that do want to see it can't see it if I don't record it. So, got our torque wrench set at 11.7 Newton meters, but they're going in quite tight anyway with um, the old thread lock that's on there, so that's cool. And plus, the new thread lock is going to help them. So, I don't think they're going to fall out because I can't hardly turn them in with my fingers with this extension, and this has got a knurl on it, so. They ain't going nowhere, as they say. Right, so we'll get our torque wrench. Set at 11.7 newton meters or nine pounds feet. So we just wind them in. One, it's so tempting to pull them tighter, but <clears throat> again, if we overstretch the heads and the heads break off, the engine ain't gonna like that very much, is it? There we go, give another little tweak. And hope and pray they don't come out. So 
that's those in. That's the oil squirter jets done. So now we're ready to get the crank in. So what I'm going to do off camera is give the crank a really good clean. Blow it all through. Just be aware when you are blowing stuff through. If you've got your crank sat on a bench and there's dirt on the back of the bench, when you're blowing the crank, you're probably lifting the dirt off the bench and it's falling back down on your crank. So just bear that in mind. You need to do it in a plastic box or outside away from anything. So uh, we'll get that done when the rain stops and uh, I'll see you in a minute and we'll get refitted. Okay, so crank's all clean, block's all clean, everything's been blown out. I've put a drop of oil down each of the threads. Just a little run off of the brush, not enough to hydraulic it, just to give the thread some lubrication. Um, obviously these are all stoned, the bearing caps are all stoned. I don't mean stoned as in, can't walk in a straight line, I mean stoned off. Um, crank's all blown off, crank's all clean, so everything's nice and spotless there. So we're ready to go. So um, thank you to Tim from um, Race Developments. He's given me his last drop of engine assembly lube here because I didn't have any. So hopefully we should be able to get a drop out. Okay, so as you can see, this stuff is very, very sticky. And it's a, uh, see, it looks like strawberry jam. It's a very, very sticky product. And it's, it's a special product in that it's designed to stick to the surfaces and stay stuck to the surfaces. Um, and not run off so basically that initial you know when you turn your engine over and you don't want it to fire like with this one I won't prime the diesel pump and then it won't fire so I'll turn it over get the oil pressure up but in that in that time between the oil pressure comes up everything is basically turning dry if you like so the oil's got to fill up all the galleries get some pressure in behind the crank and everything and this is just going to take care of everything while that's going on what we must do is make sure we don't smear it up onto these faces here. I don't want a hydraulic on these faces. I want these faces bone dry and clean. So I'm just going to put it in the bottom there and not turn the crank. I'm just going to place the crank in. I'm going to put a little bit more in that one there. And then what I think I'll do is just put another drop on the actual um, bearing caps or I might put a drop on the crank actually after I drop the crank in. So let's get the crank in. I've got an Allen bolt stuck in the back face so I can actually lift it easily. Um, it's actually like an M11 thread, I think, for the flywheel bolt, but I've got an M10 in there, it holds. So lift the crank up and then we'll just come along and drop it in. Oop, I know what I haven't done. I haven't put any lubrication on the thrust faces. So let's get some lubrication and spread it on these thrust faces. It doesn't need to be too much, it just needs to be something on there. As I say, it's very sticky. Okay, so we've got another little drop on all of those and that'll, that'll help. So, um, basically, we can come along now with our crank and just drop it in. It's job done. So there we go, just drop the crank in, let it sit there, don't turn anything. We'll take that bolt out. So we don't forget. And then what I think I'll do, just for a little bit of uh, assurance, I guess you can't really have too much. I'm just going to put a little drop. He says it's, it's very sticky, so it wants to go everywhere. And I don't want it going on those mating faces. on each of these bearings just like so put the lid down make sure I stand the bottle upside down because it's uh, as I say he's given me it's the last drop he had so hopefully he won't have any engines to build on Monday or he'll be cursing me if you look about Tim Radley at Race Developments um, at the moment he's kind of specialising in the Audi five cylinders but he, he'll kind of build anything really um, and he's not just an engine assembler he's a proper race builder and he's also got a five axis or seven axis a five axis CNC machine and he does all the you know the fancy milling and drilling of the heads and everything milling and porting of the heads so um yeah proper proper race engine business so we can now put number one on Number one, remember the numbered, and we've got the arrow facing forward, so we can drop that one on. 
I'm not going to press anything yet. Okay, and then number two. Remember these bolts are going to go in and these bolts are going to be replaced. Now, I've had an email to say that the package is due on Monday. So what I'm going to do now is just put the bolts in, torque them down to the specified torque and not bother with the angle. Um, in fact, there's something I want to show you guys. So there we go. So I'm going to drop these bolts in now to make sure they're aligned because there's no there's no axial alignment for these at all. You're relying on the position of the bolt holes, which are a foul fit. So foul fit means like if you have a dowel going into a tight hole, that's a location. A foul fit is when you've got a, a loose hole. So it's literally like a you know a six mil pin going into a ten mil hole. It's just a rough guide so that you don't sort of get anything wrong. But what I was going to show you, I, I set up a little block of metal with an M12 thread in it in the vise and I basically got these bolts or one of these bolts and I did them to the torque specified in the manual and then the 105 degrees as specified in the manual. These are being a pain. I think they want to be tapped down. And uh, yeah, I went to the 105 degrees as specified in the manual. And um, and sure enough, I measured the length, the overall length of the bolt, and it was a hundred point five millimeters. So I can only assume they were hundred millimeters standard. And then I pulled it down and I measured it so I had the, I had the thread sticking at the end. And I measured it in its stretch condition. And it was 100.9. So they actually stretched 0.4 of a millimetre. That's massive. And, um, come on. And, uh, basically, uh, they go straight back to 105 when you undo them. So, as I've said before, it says in the manual that you can use these four times. Now the thing I always wonder, and maybe if anyone professional out there can tell me, with these standard engines, um, it's no good asking Tim because he only uses ARP and, and stuff and, and his own special head fixings. Um, but with these standard stretch bolts, like here they say you can use them four times, so if you torque them down three times to get the right bearing clearances, have you used them three times, or do they mean use three times as in run three times so that's what i'd like to know but they cost about 40 pounds a set they're about four quid each so for 40 quid i'm not going to have the worry but, you know because once you take them once you stretch them too many times they don't stretch anymore and then you have no you have no clamping so i'm going to get these torqued down and we should be good to go. What the hell, you guys like to watch it all soak. If you don't want to see me talk it down, just fast forward until you see me put the spanners down. But um, what I'm going to do first of all is just snug these bolts down so they're all pulled down and making contact. So that I know I'm not putting any bearings on the angle or whatever when I start to torque them up. You don't want to be torquing this up to 45 newton meters when this one's still up in the air. That's not, uh, that is not good not good at all with any assembly always just nip it down so that the bolt heads are just making contact finger tight isn't enough because you won't overcome the friction on the sides here so i'm just going to check these are all nipped down yes they are i know i'm not using the right sequence i just want to make sure they're all down and sort of down onto the flat okay so that's good so now i've got a torque wrench here set 45 newton meters okay so we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
nine, ten. And then we're going to go eight millimeters so we get the big boy out. I put my foot behind the stand so it doesn't run around the garage after me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, just like that. Okay, so that's torqued down. Now we should go 105 degrees. Now, as you know, this is always a problem because it wants to run across the floor. So I'm not sure if it's going to let me go 105 degrees, but we'll see how we get on. Okay, so let's up against it. Let's see if I can just get to 90 or something. No, I'm not going to be able to do it. I'll turn the camera off, I'll angle them down and then I'll be back. Okay, so I've done them now. I've literally just gone 60, 60 degrees just to make sure they're all down. And then when I replace these bolts, what I'll do is I'll undo one at a time, replace the bolt, replace the bolt like that, and uh, go like that. So um, it's only so I can get this engine built. So, moment of truth, I haven't done this yet. So we'll see if it turns. And yes, it does. It turns beautifully. And we can see that it's got quite a amount of friction there because of the stickiness of the goo we put in but we can see it's all free rotating and there's no tight spots that's what we're feeling for if you feel a tight spot feel if it goes feel if it comes back tight spots will just generally be debris or crap in your um not, sorry debris or a run out on your crank the other thing we need to check is end float. I've already checked that and it's five thousand. And what you do is you get a bar or a screwdriver or something which somebody's going to complain about because everybody uses screwdrivers in the wrong way. So you push the crank back, put a clock on the front, measure set to zero, and then pull the crank that way. This one is about five or six thou. The actual spec is crazy. It's something like 0.05 to 0.3. This is crazy. Um, Yes, it's a massive amount of end float you can have. You can just hear it. Just hear the end float I've got on there now. So you have to have some end float for the thrust, but if you've got too much, your crank will be dancing around. You don't want too much. Um, you want the minimum, really, you can have. But with these, you, you can't change it. So it's, it's set in stone, that's it. So there we are. That's that done. So now the next thing I need to do is look at getting the pistons in. And... I think I might leave that till tomorrow because of the weather so crap and it's starting to get cold as well which is a bit weird so um I'll see you for the next one hope you've enjoyed this hope you've learned something um, already we can see when we look down in here I grab the camera we talked about doing these oil cooler jets with the engine in the car um, if you bring your rod up there obviously your conrod's going to be well in the way so you need to have that cylinder which is number one you'd have to have number one over there and then you've got the slot down here you can get to it so you're going to be trying to feed up through there and get that in so what you could perhaps do is have it so the counterweight sorry I've got the camera anyway. have it so the counterweight is like that that may that gives you a little bit more room but remember you have the con rod sticking out here so it's probably doable but with the ladder framing i don't think it is um it's probably an engine out job at least you, i mean there's no reason why you couldn't take the engine out turn it over and take all this off take the ladder frame off without actually disturbing anything this is only a ring of bolts around here that hold this ladder frame on they're only tightened up to like 18 pounds feet um and there's a couple of gaskets on here where you could probably replace them with silicon if you wanted to and then and then go from there um you know you could possibly do it without even disturbing the the, the seals at the ends I, I don't know but um it's something we'll look at later on so thanks for watching this one i hope it hasn't been too boring for you um and i hope you've enjoyed it 
But uh, just to recap, we've got our squirter jets in. We've used Loctite 243 on the threads. We've used engine assembly lube. We've got our bearings in. We've got that filter underneath the number one main. We've got all our bearing caps on. Everything's been stoned. Everything's been cleaned. And as a result, we've got lovely, smooth turning crankshaft with no tight spots. Feels a little tight, obviously, because that lube is so sticky. But um, really, really pleased with how that's come out. So uh, there we go, guys. Thanks for watching. Just see what it looks like. There you go. That's what it looks like in the... Uh, when it's all in the camera when I just hold the bloody thing still. So um, I'll see you all maybe tomorrow for another part. Bye for now.